to get to the bottom line, get to the truth. Anybody like to tackle that one? Well, let me give you an example. The Fed Reserve IG is required to examine all failed FDIC insured institutions that have resulted in a material loss to the deposit insurance fund. Now, I'd like to know whether any of the IGs here today have had similar statutory requirements that would permit them to examine financial institutions that have failed or that require government assistance to remain solvent. Wouldn't such requirements for the IG from the SEC or the CFTC make sense if we should witness another Lehman Brothers or collapse of a hedge fund that is significantly uh, leveraged in commodities or futures? What is it that you would need? And anyone can respond. Well, uh, let me Sonic. respond for the, uh, for the National Credit Union Administration. Mm -hmm. uh, like the FDIC and, uh, and, the, and the Treasury, we have a legislation in the Federal Credit Union Act that requires us to do a material loss review of any failed uh, institution, in this case a credit union, that uh, causes a loss of uh, greater than $10 million to the share insurance fund. Mm -hmm. And we've already completed two of those uh, reviews right now. We're doing two more, and we've got about three or four more in the, uh, in the queue waiting, waiting, to, waiting to do those. So we have the authority we need to do those material loss reviews. We are doing the work. It is stretching our resources as, as far as we can possibly go. And uh, the only thing I would, I would request is uh, I, I would wish that the, that the Congress uh, and, the, and the agency and the agencies that uh, have the authority uh, would provide the inspectors general with whatever resources they, they need in order to get that work done. Uh, in my case, I did request additional staff. We're hiring an additional staff person. In fact, she'll be coming on board on Monday, and that will help alleviate some of our, some of our problems. And we also requested additional uh, funding contract dollars. We did get the contract dollars in our budget, so we can, uh, we can use the additional staff and contract dollars to augment some of our uh, material loss review work. But we do have the authority that we need uh, right now to look into those failed institutions. Well, you just answered my next question, if you had uh, reasonable resources, yes. and I understand uh, yeah. you don't. Uh, let me pose something else. Under current law, the heads of six federal agencies, including Treasury and the Federal Reserve, are permitted to terminate or prevent an IG from carrying out an audit, uh, investigation, examining other activities for specified reasons that include national security or criminal investigative matters. While I would never want an inquiry of any kind to jeopardize a criminal or a national security matter, I'm concerned that this type of exemption and power for an agency head is excessive over what is supposed to be an independent office. I'd like to hear from any of you or each of you whether the law ought to be altered in some way to ensure that these exemptions are not misused. Now, let me give you an example. I suppose the Treasury Secretary or the Fed Chairman could make a case that market instability or systemic risk may be a threat to national security. How many times like that? <laughs> so perhaps an examination of firms on the verge of collapse is inappropriate. Now, would you consider this an inappropriate use of the law and uh, for GAO, for the record, would you be able to determine how many IG investigations or audits? He's going? Yeah, he's, okay, let me just cancel that part out. I don't see him in the room. But uh, we as Congress, uh, what were cut off from the information uh, shall I say, linkages out of the White House. We stood in the dark on many things. And uh, when the whole economic crisis 
uh, came out publicly in September, and we had to move real quickly. I was stunned. How did the market collapse so quickly and nobody forecasted it? That blows my mind. You know, I know that people in futures, isn't that what futurists are all about? What happened? Mr. Irvin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I can't comment on the futures aspect of this, but you, you're, you began by asking about our position on these various provisions for certain IGs that allow the agency head to prevent the Inspector General from pursuing an investigation or audit on national security grounds. I touched on that in my prepared remarks. There is such a provision for the CIA Inspector General, for the Justice Department Inspector General, for the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General, so I was under that provision when I was the Inspector General there, and the Treasury Inspector General, but as I mentioned in my statement, uh, the, uh, the, a Treasury Secretary would not have to make the argument that a particular investigation might impinge upon national security. There is a specific provision in the Treasury IG statute that allows a Treasury Secretary to stymie an investigation if in the judgment of the Treasury Secretary there would be adverse market effects from such an investigation without having to show any national security nexus. And my position is that all such provisions should be excised from the applicable statutes because uh, a, an agency head could use such provisions, as you are suggesting, merely to shield an administration from political embarrassment or because an investigation might, in its conclusion, be contrary to the ideology of a given administration. So I'm very much opposed to those provisions. I had in my very first, and I'll conclude, I had in my very first meeting with then Secretary Designate Ridge a discussion about this very provision in the Department of Homeland Security statute. And I told him that if I were to be confirmed, I would work very hard in the spirit of full disclosure to, with Congress to try to get that provision excised. He assured me that he would never use the provision, and to his credit, he never did. But the fact that it was in the statute was always a potential sort of Damocles over the head of the Inspector General. And I think this present economic crisis that we are experiencing towards uh, how important it is to excise such provisions. I would just want to echo um, my friend Mr. Irvin's comments. I think that's a very... Uh, problematic provision, and I think it's something that the Congress should be reviewing. Uh, Madam Chair, I wonder if I could also comment. I, I can't comment as CRS on whether it would be good or bad to remove this provision, but uh, the way the provision works now is that for the Federal Reserve, for example, the chairman makes a statement to the IG that he's going to be exercising this power, and then the IG provides the explanatory statement to Congress um, within 30 days. One way or one approach might be that the statement could go directly to Congress from the Chairman of the Federal Reserve or from the Secretary of the Treasury so that um, Congress receives direct notification and you could place a time limit, you know, so it would occur within three days or five days or, or whatever, um, so you would know immediately if such power was being exercised. Thank you. I'd like to direct this to Mr. Kotz. And in uh, 2008, every of uh, Senator Grassley's, your office completed two inquiries on the effectiveness of the SEC's consolidated supervised entities and broker deal risk assessment programs. And these were done in response to the fall of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Your SEC report made 26 recommendations to the SEC for areas needing improvement and several recommendations regarding the risk assessment program. First, can you tell us how many of these recommendations are in the implementation, implementation stage by the SEC? And then now let me just add the other couple of questions on the same issue. Okay, yeah, we, we actually just received uh, the way there's a process in our office. They, the agency comes to us and says we'd like to close these recommendations and then we make a decision that we think that it's appropriate to close the recommendation and provide advice on that. So we recently received from the SEC numerous requests to close recommendations. Many of the rec almost all the recommendations in the CSE report and many of the recommendations in the broker-dealer risk assessment report. However, I'll tell you, we're looking at them very carefully to, to see if we believe that sufficient uh, work has been done to close them. So there's certainly an effort on the part of the agency 
to try to demonstrate that they have implemented those recommendations. But we have not completed our process as to whether we believe that they actually have been. And we're very careful and we scrutinize very carefully uh, what the agency has done before we actually agree that something should be closed. Now, did you take initiative on your own to inquire uh, how did Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers get to where they are? Yeah, well, I mean, we conducted that uh, audit report. Uh, we conducted the audit uh, looking at Bear Stearns and to try to figure out uh, how it is that this process went forward while the SEC was engaged in regulation, and yet, as you said, it seemed to be a surprise to everybody. And it's one thing for it to be a surprise to you know, an investor out there. It's another thing for it to be surprised for the regulator who are meeting with the folks from the entities, you know, on a common basis. Um, and, and going back to your uh, previous point, it was raised somewhat in our audit uh, that, that if we issued this report, it would have some effect on the markets because it was very critical of the SEC. Um, and uh, there was no provision in place like with those other agencies. <laughs> Uh, the, those are all the, the, the presidentially appointed IG agencies. In, in those cases, there was a provision that allowed the agency head to stop it. In our case, it was suggested that perhaps this would have an adverse impact, and we simply said, well, thank you very much, but we're going to go ahead and issue the report anyway. So um, this was a case where we did feel it was important to get out the information about what happened with the SEC's regulation of Bear Stearns and provided a uh, comprehensive report. and. Uh, and up to make sure they actually did what they say they were going to do. You know, it's like trying to unscramble eggs. Yeah. I don't know if it can ever be done. But anyway, um, did you find that there was enough there before it was revealed to really get started investigating? I think I heard you say we were taking a look at it. You know, all of a sudden this thing blew up right. into the public. And I'm wondering, what yeah. were the indicators along the way? Yeah, I mean, you... We found that, you know, the, the SEC was aware of vulnerabilities on the part of Bear Stearns um, and did not place enough pressure on Bear Stearns to reduce its leverage or risk. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a little bit difficult because hindsight is 2020. So at that point in time, you, you, after it happened, you look at the indicators and you say, oh, that was an indicator. But, but nevertheless, we did find that there were situations where uh, the agency was aware of potential risk factors and yet did not pressure Bear Stearns enough with respect to those risk factors. We also found, for example, that um, there were certain standards that the SEC could have been tougher with requiring Bear Stearns to uh, comply with. We found that the SEC authorized those firms to have internal audit staff perform critical audit work. So they allowed internal audit staff to perform the, the audit work involving risk management rather than have an outside entity. Obviously, if you have an outside entity, you're going to have uh, better audit work. So there were specific areas that we found that we felt after looking at it, uh, even with hindsight being 2020, that, that said, these are indicators. Y you missed these indicators. How come? You didn't uh, see this at the time. And then we make recommendations so the SEC now knows how to deal with things uh, going forward. Uh, you deserve a drink of water. I'm going to go to Ms. <laughs> Thank to you. Um, what are, Mr. Desarno, the greatest challenges that uh, now face the NCUA and its oversight of the credit union industry and are credit unions also experiencing higher default rates from mortgages? And has the recession exposed an increasing number of NCUA insured institutions? Well, let me say, first of all, that uh, I've been at NCUA for, uh, for about 11 years. And this is the first time we've had to do any material loss reviews. So what that means is that we've never had yeah. losses to the share insurance fund of, of $10 million or more, and we're having them now. But with that said, uh, I, I think I, I can comfortably say that the credit union industry is, is much better off uh, th than, than the banking industry. And it may sound self-serving, but it, it's because they really didn't get involved.
a lot of the riskier in investments and in, and in, uh, in, in, in investments. Uh, for the most part, uh, credit unions were uh, were involved. They did they did make mortgages and they did make mortgage loans, but. Uh, and they are having some higher some higher default rates, but that's not causing them the problems uh, of going out of business. The material loss reviews that we have done so far in two specific uh, credit unions, and the reason th those credit unions went down is because they got involved in very speculative uh, uh, real estate deals outside of their area of influence. These were credit unions that, in, in the middle of the country that decided they were going to get involved in the real estate uh, market in Florida, and when the housing market went down, then they lost an awful lot of money. And NCOA now is taking, taking steps to prevent that from happening in the future. Uh, it, looking forward, what are the, the, the most critical uh, challenges right now? I think the most critical challenge right now for NCOA is dealing with the corporate credit structure. They're taking action right right now. That and because the corporate credit unions were the ones that were involved in investing in mortgage-backed securities, and of course they got bit by the mortgage-backed security problem that every everyone else has has run into. And so NCOA right now is in the process of uh, trying to restructure the corporate credit credit unions, and I think that will have a, a, a positive impact on the credit union industry as we go forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Lavick. Uh, um, the futures industry has had some instances of um, bankruptcy failure, but certainly not to the same extent as commercial banks or, from what Bill says, uh, credit unions. Partly, I think, it's because of the provision of margin. Um, you had to uh, put up margin to buy a futures contract, and that is um, adjusted. Am I correct, Judy? It's back here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, daily. So, for example, if your uh, price of your stock goes down, or your stock, your future, uh, you had to put up more margin. So there have been some failures, but interestingly enough, the two I'm aware of were not recently. They go back, um, one case, about five years. The fellow who was in charge of it was a rather big, what they call a future uh, commission merchant, is now spending some time in jail. And there was a um, one about two or three years ago. But anyway, the point being, I can't think of one right now of a large size that has been in the recent um, economic turmoil. We've been lucky. <laughs> yeah, I always uh, saw credit unions differently because it's the field of people who invest in their credit union, and usually they're in... It's a cooperative move. It's yes. a cooperative yeah. move. And uh, they don't take the same kind of risk. And I've always been stunned by the fact that we don't know what's inside those portfolios. <laughs> and when you, you make the wrong decision, yeah. we suffer. And so, you know, not being able to get to that kind of information leaves it strung out. Uh, I, I want to know also, has the newly combined Council on Inspector, Inspector Generals for Integrity and Efficiency improved the coordination and the efficacy of IGs? Anybody? Want to talk about improvement? The one thing I would yet? say uh, is that when you met separately, there were usually 25 to 30 people in the room, depending on a particular time. Now there's almost 60. And my uh, impression generally, and I think there's some studies on this, the more people you have in a, a room can inhibit decision making or consensus. Now that has some pluses, but frankly, uh, and I will defer to my deputy back here, Miss Judith Ringel, because you've actually gone to the meetings, haven't you? <laughs> what is your... Uh... So far, they're crowded. <laughs> they're crowded, uh, she says. Crowded. Yeah. I, I have to say, I, as you can probably tell from my comments, I'm not sure it was a positive move to combine the two. Do they feel intimidated? Uh, do you think that large group sitting among the experts you know, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I've always been in the ECIE. Uh, and I used to go to some of their meetings because I was uh, adjunct. I didn't feel intimidated. It's, it's like any, uh, well, that was smaller. That was the 30 people. It's like anything. Uh, you find some really sharp PCIEs, and you find some sharp maybe ECIEs, but you find some who aren't that much. Let me, I, I just want to you know, add a comment to that as well. 
we've only had about th I think we've had maybe three three joint meetings now so far as this uh, CIGI C I C I G I E, and I think it is helpful, even though it's a bigger room and it, it, it it's a it's a much much bigger bigger setting. I think it's good that everybody meets at the same time and we're all getting the same message at the same time because in the past even though we we had uh, you know, we met individually as a as a PCIE and was a smaller group. A lot of times, we weren't getting the same message as the as the PCIE presidentially appointed IGs. So I think now we're all getting the same message. We all have the same opportunities. So I think I think it'll I think it'll work out uh, for the best. Thank you, Ms. Burroughs. Uh, how are the DFE IGs currently evaluated when their urgent agency heads? Uh, have the appointment authority, and are there independent evaluations that are conducted, or is it done by agency personnel, and is the process different from the presidential appointment IG? Well, currently, both the presidentially appointed IGs and the designated federal entity IGs have to be appointed uh, without regard to political affiliation and solely based on their skills in auditing and um, other uh, management and other types of skills. But I couldn't necessarily speak to how each agency decides how to appoint its IG. Um, it might vary between the agency. I don't think that there's necessarily any criteria that they're looking for. Um, uh, but that might be a question to that I could, you know, research and get back to you. Could you do that? Sure, of course. Put it be happy to. We appreciate that. Excuse me, madam. Yeah. Uh, um, one of the things in our agency, uh, when when I was initially appointed, uh, the person did rate me. Uh, but I would say it's well over ten years ago now that we came uh, to an agreement that. Um, we are not rated, and we don't take bonuses. This is even before the legislation has now uh, that's now forbids it. And I, that's certainly very helpful because there are subtle pressures one can make in ratings and so on, uh, as we are all aware of. But at least, as I say in my agency, and I can't speak for that, though I think there are many others are not evaluated, rated uh, by their chairman. But certainly the CFTC, we haven't been, and that goes back, I'd say, to 1998, several years. Yeah, the, the situation is very similar at NCUA. Uh, uh, I, I do not, you know, we're on a, a merit, uh, merit pay uh, system. Uh, so I don't receive, I receive kind of like a pass-fail evaluation almost, but the, my average increase is just the average of what the other senior staff receive for that year. So it's not a written performance evaluation, so I'm not, I'm not going to be downgraded or penalized if I issue a hard-hitting report. I mean, that won't, that won't happen. And uh, so my increase would just be the average of what the, the, other, staff, the other senior staff members get. Mm -hmm. If I could also add, um, in 2005, there was a, a controversy with the Legal Services Corporation that they had tried, the board of the Legal Services Corporation had tried to impose performance evaluations on their IG after their IG had issued some reports that were highly critical of how the agency was spending its resources because it's an agency that generally serves, um, provides legal services to the poor. Um, and CRS had done an analysis as to whether it was uh, legally tenable to require performance evaluations of IGs. There's um, no specific part in the IG Act that would prohibit a performance evaluation, but the general um, tenets of the IG Act in terms of independence and only general supervision by the agency head would seem to indicate that that would not be a favorable um, avenue to pursue in terms of the agency head conducting a performance evaluation of, of its IG. But uh, that could be something that Congress could clarify that this would be a prohibited act to um, conduct a performance evaluation of an IG. Madam Chairwoman, in our review of the Inspectors General, um, our sense was the only time that was at all operative was prior to the legislation when some DFEs were actually receiving bonuses, many of which wouldn't accept them even though they were eligible to, uh, because... Well, please don't mention the word, the B word, bonuses. Right. Well, I mean, you know, and as, as you can imagine, there's the, such a problem with that. And so that is, the law then prohibited such bonuses and sort of removed that concept from the, uh, the IG system as far I understand. And if I could add to that, in my um, experience as a presidentially appointed IG, I'd say a couple things. There is... There Move that mic. Yes. I, I, may I dispense with it? I don't know that it's necessary, but... I hear you yeah. without it. Um, I can't. You can? Okay. 
All right. Can you? Is that all right? Well, the rays are colliding. All right. Um, Let's see. There, for presidentially appointed IGs, there really isn't an evaluation process per se. Um, certainly, there's no evaluation by the agency head. Of course, if there are complaints against an IG, those could be lodged with the PCIA under the old system, and, and that system uh, uh, continues to this day. Uh, and a complaint can be lodged, and that's investigated. In terms of, of salary compensation, as, as Ms. Bryan said, the issue arose of since an, a presidentially appointed IG controlled his or her budget, in theory, an IG could give himself or herself a bonus, but that was never done. Obviously, it was frowned upon. If I just might take this also to say a quick word, since we're talking about Please bonuses do, and salaries. Please do, because you were the next I was going to call on, and right. I think you're addressing most of my questions. So go on, ahead. On this salary issue, because it's tangentially related, a number of people have raised the point that one of the effects of this legislation that we're here to talk about would be, in effect, to lower the compensation of inspectors general who are not presidentially appointed if they were to be. And, and certainly that is a legitimate concern. I think that should be addressed separately. Of course, I would not support an effect where, as a consequence of this, their salaries would be diminished. But to me, that is not an argument for not appointing, the making these uh, inspectors general presidentially appointed, as I say, doing so clearly and only logically, it seems to me, would enhance their independence. Thank you so much. Uh you covered some of the questions I was going to ask, so we're going to go to our last witness now, Ms. Bryan. Uh, our recommendation continues in your most recent report on IG states that Congress should consider adding more meaningful and reflective reporting requirements to statutorily require semi-annual reports. So please describe for us uh, what some of these might be. Well, what I found is when, when we looked at the numbers, and this goes back to my earlier uh, questioning of using numbers to measure the effectiveness of an IG's work, one of the measures that an IG is required to report uh, in their SAR, which we found, sadly, there's a lot of work that goes into these semi-annual reports, or SARs, and I... Uh, I'm sad to report how few people read those reports <laughs> um, yes. because they're really boring. <laughs> they're full of a lot of numbers. Of words, and, many pages. And, and, you know, it's just calling it as it is. And so uh, one example of that is that they are to report uh, the numbers of cases uh, referred for prosecution. And that's that's a measurement that's been used. I was, uh, I was with a former deputy director of OMB where he was testifying that was a real measure of of the work of an IG. But when we got behind those numbers, you found that it really doesn't tell you very much. So, for example, if the, uh, the, the numbers of referrals for prosecution from an IG shop is declining, it is assumed that means they're, they're working less hard. It could be, however, that they're taking on much more important, putting their resources into much more important uh, audits that aren't beefing the numbers up but are taking a lot more resources. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is we found over the last 10 years we talked to a lot of prosecutors and it turns out that um, that the IG shops are referring fewer bad cases. What we found was a pretty high declination rate. They would refer a lot of cases for prosecution. The U.S. attorneys would look at them and say, this is a dog, I'm not going to do it. So there was a pretty high declination rate. Now what we're finding is the declination rate is much lower because the IGs are referring fewer but stronger cases and they're actually uh, consulting with, with uh, U.S. attorneys you know, early on in a more consultative way. So those are sort of the examples of why the numbers aren't very effective. We thought the better way of approaching reports to Congress were to look at what the IG thought was the most important work. What were the things they really wanted the, the Congress to be aware of that was happening in their agencies? If that kind of reporting is done and really focus the SARS in those ways, then maybe you would be able to find out, you know, as an early warning in some of these crises that are approaching us and we're saying, how do we find out about them after the fact? I appreciate that. And we've seen a couple of cases in recent years where uh, the IGs were found to have acted inappropriately or to have conflicts with the very agencies they are charged with uh, overseeing. And uh, are there adequate measures in place, such as peer review, which has been mentioned already, or external monitoring programs to keep check? on these IG offices? Uh, thank you for that question. We looked at the, the, uh, 
The mechanism that is used to evaluate NIG's uh, poor conduct is the integrity committee, of the, and that continues to be the case uh, through the laws now statutorily created. And we think that's a pretty good model where it is uh, other IGs reviewing allegations of, of, uh, of misconduct. However, there are some flaws in its execution. One is that we found uh, what has been happening is the integrity committee will have a finding or will go through an entire lengthy investigation but that won't have a, an actual finding at the end of the day. In one uh, fairly famous case, the conclusion was that the IG should be disciplined up to and including removal from office. And the, uh, in, it was in the last uh, administration and the um, OMB received this information and then came back to the integrity committee and said, so are you saying he should be removed? And because they hadn't really made that conclusion, they said, well, we didn't say that, and so nothing actually happened. Um, and so we think that's a change that needs to uh, occur. The other uh, we believe is that the integrity committee is currently now statutorily headed up by the uh, a member of the FBI. And the problem with that is that the FBI is, of course, looking for criminality. Rarely, I would hope, is it going to be the case that an IG is accused of criminality when uh, uh, it's going to be more a case of poor judgment or inappropriate behavior for an IG. And we had another case where an IG uh, was actually acknowledged that he had provided to the president, this was a presidentially appointed IG, pres uh, provided to the president a very controversial uh, report of his prior to its release for his counsel's uh, opportunity to redact information. Uh, the integrity committee concluded that he didn't, essentially he didn't violate the law, which is true. <laughs> However, I would, I would believe, most IGs would agree with me, and I certainly believe, that that was really inappropriate behavior for an IG. So if that committee were headed up by an IG rather than uh, a member of the FBI, I think the standards for conduct would be more appropriate. Well, I want to thank Mr. Kotz. Cernal, Mr. Lavik, Ms. Burroughs, Mr. Irwin, and Ms. Bryan for your expert testimony. And believe me, we've taken a lot of this down. Our work is just beginning. And if there's one place that I think Congress has failed, and that is in its oversight duties. As uh, the Secretary of Labor said in her acceptance speech, there's a new sheriff in town. So I, I want to thank my uh, colleagues who were here and had to leave. And I want to thank each and every one of you for the time you have given us this afternoon and the wealth of information to start our wheels rolling. I think you're going to see a difference now uh, with the new administration and more openness and all and our concerns about how do we get ourselves into this mess. We've got to an answer to the people who sent us here to Washington. We expect to be able to do that, and we expect to be able to mitigate some of these problems, provide solutions, so that they who pay their taxes will have a better quality of life. So without objection, this committee is adjourned with a sincere thanks to all of you and my staff.
this and it's our lives that we want to not feel like going through some of the same stuff and saying that it's going to happen to us. And thank you for that initial. Uh, I've done everything in my lifetime to try to get down here. I didn't get in here necessarily to make a pot in the 80s and secure funding. Not only to reach a level of frustration, um, but essentially I was hired in before we even started the process. Um, so I'm not sure that process that we went through is along the lines of what you're alluding to, but I'll just share it anyway. Would you identify yourself, please? I'm sorry. My name is Alan Delaney. Um, I'm the president of DCS Staff and Academic Professionals for Compulsory Learning. Um, we went through uh, the agency of the SBA um, under the SCORE uh, program, followed all the necessary things pertaining to uh, business planning of that nature in terms of their counseling with all of their tools, only to get to a point of when it came to the loan process of uh, the express loan, I believe it's 8A, that they uh, referred us to. Uh, now it's to the point where it stalled. Uh, the situation with me is that I'm the type of individual that I'm going to move and I'm going to move at a feverish pace. So for, on my end, essentially five years, um, and now we're at a stall standpoint when it comes to the funding. Um, I just want some specifics. Bottom line is that it is what it is, regardless of if we qualify or we don't. I just need to know so that we can create a plan to continue on with making provisions, not just for DCS, but again, I'm, a, I'm the type of individual that I'm making provisions for people within my community as well, not just my company. Sir, it, it, it sounds like your question is probably not that directed to Mr. Nelson, but related to uh, an SBA for this matter. Um, and I would encourage you to ask you to, to talk to one of our to members of staff, uh, have them bring uh, one of the counsel to follow up with you. I, I would note, though, that the SBA loan, loan stream is called the economic vision. Uh, uh, ABS backed by SBA loans are one of the assets that are exempted from the program currently. Uh, so and it is post. Perhaps um, if folks would like to sort of line up at the mic in the interest of time, uh, please uh, introduce yourself when you uh, state your question. Thank you. My name is Brian Milan, uh, Chairman and CEO of Lifestone Capital Group, and a financial advisor for the federal government. I'm also a principal attorney here. Um, my question relates to the product that we're dealing with that I guess Ralph as well. Um, if you allow talk about <coughs> the solution being one size, but what uh, what are you doing to motivate? to actually sell the asset. 
just one comment. We're going to try to get in as many questions as possible.